Welcome back. Hopefully you've been taking a little bit of a break and are ready to learn about long ultrasound image interpretation. So without further ado, let's get started. This is probably the most widely cited of the long ultrasound interpretation protocols. It's named the Blue Protocol and was created by Liechtenstein and Mezier in the journal Chest in 2008. It allowed them to arrive at a diagnosis in patients presenting with acute respiratory failure in an ICU setting with a 90.5% accuracy. At first glance, it can seem complicated, but we can break it down into a few basic patterns to recognize in different steps. The first step is to assess whether there is presence of lung sliding. Once its presence has been established, we need to, to be able to assess for the presence of A lines, B lines, consolidation, or lung point, or the point where non-sliding lung begins to slide. Let's go over these findings individually, as well as the other lung ultrasound finding of pleural effusion. This is the basic lung ultrasound view. We initially see subcutaneous tissues. A little deeper, we have different white lines. There are these two mildly higher lines that represent the ribs. We can know they are the ribs by the characteristic shadowing deep to them. The white line between them and just deep to them is the pleura. The culmination of all of this is termed the bat sign. If there is air below the pleura, either from healthy lung or pneumothorax, we will be able to see reverberation artifact as repetitions of the pleural line at multiples of the distance between the transducer and the pleura. This is the A-line pattern and indicates that there is air just below the pleura, either in the lung, in emphysema blebs, or between the visceral and parietal pleura, so in pneumothorax. It's important to see both ribs and the bat sign to not mistake another artifact as A-lines. As you can see here, it would be easy to say that this clip represents A-lines. However, by sliding the probe over a little, we can find the true pleura and see that what we were seeing was in fact reverberation artifact from the rib itself. Remember, any strong reflector can create reverberation artifact and produce an artifact that looks like A-lines. This is why it's important to see the bat sign because the pleura will be the first bright white line deep to the bright white lines caused by the ribs. Once you've found the pleural line, the next question is whether or not the parietal and visceral pleura are in contact to ensure there is no pneumothorax. When the parietal and visceral pleura are touching, the rubbing that happens between them during ventilation produces a kind of shimmering that's been likened to ants crawling and is termed pleural sliding. When patients aren't breathing or ventilation in the area is minimal, as can happen with low tidal volume ventilation or in regions overdistended by high PEEP or obstructive lung disease, the only indication of the contact between the two pleuras may be the effects of cardiac oscillations making them vibrate together. This is termed lung pulse and, like lung sliding, indicates pleural contact and rules out pneumothorax in that area. On occasion, the pleural sliding or pulse can be difficult to see. Decreasing the gain, even down as far as it will go, will often enhance the contrast so that the pleura and its movement can be seen more clearly. Other useful tricks are adjusting the depth so the pleura is in the middle of the screen, switching to a linear probe to enhance resolution, and using M mode, as we will discuss shortly. Another useful trick for optimizing the image and the appearance of artifacts is ensuring the probe is perpendicular with the pleura. This is achieved by slowly tilting the probe until art artifacts are optimized, as is happening here with progressively clearer and more numerous A-lines appearing as we get more perpendicular with the pleura. 
On occasion, you will notice that on some of the following clips, we do not see the bat sign. This is generally because we have found the bat sign, have confirmed which line is the plural line, but once this is done, it may be necessary to not have both ribs in view in order to have the best view possible of the structures you're trying to look at on your image. However, you should still always start by finding your boundaries, and this will mean finding the bat sign to make sure the line you are looking at is the plural line. Here is an image of loss of lung sliding. We can still see that there is some motion happening, but this is not the shimmering we saw previously and is simply due to motion of the chest wall. Loss of lung sliding and pulse alone do not indicate that there is definitely a pneumothorax present. Rather, presence of lung sliding or pulse exclude pneumothorax at that point. Here, we can clearly see there is lung sliding on the right of the screen, while there isn't any on the left. Here is an example of lung point, or the intersection of sliding and not sliding lung. This is diagnostic of a pneumothorax. This is the point where the pleura go from being in contact to not being in contact. As we can see here on this chest CT, the location of this point changes somewhat with inspiration and expiration, which is why we see intermittent sliding and loss of sliding at the same location on the pleura. It is also possible to demonstrate lung sliding the absence of lung sliding, and the lung point on M mode. Since the subcutaneous tissues aren't moving, they appear as straight lines above the pleura. If the pleura is also not moving, we will also see that the artifacts below it are not moving as we see here. This has been termed the barcode sign, given the pres presence of all straight lines on the screen. If the pleura are rubbing, the pleural line and the artifacts below it have a grainy appearance given the movement or friction. This has been likened to sand, and so this is called a seashore sign, where above the pleura are the linear waves from the static subcutaneous tissues that look like still waters, and at the level of the pleura and below are the grainy, sandy shores. If we see both of these signs at a given point, then we have the transition from sliding to not sliding and vice versa. That happens with breathing. And so we have a lung point, which is diagnostic of a pneumothorax. The reason a lung point is necessary to diagnose a pneumothorax is because other phenomena can stop the pleura from rubbing against each other, such as emphysema, emphysema blebs, therapeutic pleurodesis, pleurodesis from pneumonia, etc. Unfortunately, if there is no place where the two pleura come back into contact, like in this tension pneumothorax, there will be no lung point, and so it will not be possible to conclusively diagnose a pneumothorax. All you will see is loss of lung sliding. This is why it's important to integrate the clinical context into your interpretation, just like with auscultation or any diagnostic aid. Another important thing to note is that other things that intermittently rub against the pleura can resemble a lung point or create a pseudo lung point. This clip shows a pseudo lung point in a region on the left anterior, anterior chest where the pericardium intermittently touches the pleura, resembling a lung point. As you can see, what we are seeing isn't quite lung sliding, and we are able to see a structure, the pericardial space, deeper. Your eye will become trained to see the difference between these, much like your ears become trained to ear the different sounds of lung auscultation. That closes the chapter on A-lines. Next, 
let's move on to the other important artifact you will be seeing, which are beelines. These are linear artifacts created by fluid, fibrosis, or other phenomenon in the long interstition, as we discussed in the artifact segment. They need the two layers of the pleura to be in contact to be produced, and so their presence rules out a pneumothorax in that lung location, just like lung sliding or lung pulse does. In order to be called beelines, these lines have to meet certain criteria. They have to be straight, well-defined, hyperechoic lines that are in the axis of the beam. They must arise from the pleura. They must move with pleural sliding. They have to go all the way to the back of the screen or the far field. And they should obliterate A-lines along their path. This doesn't mean that A-lines and B-lines can't coexist in one window or screen. We see here that they can. Rather, if a B-line goes through an A-line, we lose the A-line at the spot where they meet. When fluid in the interstitium is causing B-lines, the pleura will appear regular, as it does here. Here are the same B lines with a regular pleura, but seen this time with a linear probe for better resolution. When you see this, it is generally caused by fluid, and so non-inflammatory conditions such as cardiogenic pulmonary edema should be high on your differential diagnosis. When the B lines are from an inflammatory or fibrosing process, the pleura will tend to appear more jagged and have an irregular shape, as it does here. Again, here are B-lines with an irregular, jagged pleura in a patient with ARDS, this time imaged with a linear probe. If the pleura looks like this, inflammatory conditions such as ARDS, pneumonia, or inflammatory interstitial lung disease should be higher on your differential diagnosis. Here they are side by side with the regular, thin, non-inflammatory pleura on the left and the irregular, jagged, inflammatory pleura appearing on the right. A few B lines, two or less, especially in dependent regions, can be normal. Much like faint and inspiratory crackles in dependent regions. However, if you see them in multiple ultrasound windows, in the non-dependent lung regions, if they are very thick, if they are numerous, so three or more signaling a B-line dominant lung profile, and if they arise in someone you suspect of having a respiratory pathology, they are more likely to reflect significant lung disease. When B-lines become very numerous, they can become confluent as they are here, and look almost as if a flashlight was shining from the pleura to the far field. We know these are confluent B lines and not normal lung, given the absence of A lines. Our next lung ultrasound finding is lung consolidation. When this occurs, the lung becomes deflated or filled with fluid and takes on a tissue density. It thus looks gray on ultrasound and is sometimes called hepatization to reflect the fact that consolidated lung looks like liver. In the case of thrans lober consolidations, the lack of significant lung aeration also allows ultrasounds to be transmitted deeper, allowing us to see deeper structures. This gives rise to the spine sign, or the visualization of the spine through the lung, which we have here. This helps us know that we are truly seeing consolidated lung and not a mirror image artifact. When the consolidation is not translober, we will see a fractal border caused by ring down artifact, which are sometimes mistaken for beelines. This is known as the shred sign and signifies a non translober consolidation. Also, interesting to note here is the decrease in size of the consolidation on inspiration. 
suggesting some component of atelectasis. As you can see here, consolidated lung generally has a density similar to the livers or the spleen, and so, if you aren't careful, you can mistake a normal abdominal organ for an abnormal lung. The best way to avoid making this mistake is to find the diaphragm, which you should always do in the lower lung zones anyway. As you may expect, an infradiaphragmatic tissue density or tissue density below the diaphragm will not be consolidated lung. At times, there can also be tissue density above the diaphragm, but not in the lung, as we can see here. From top to bottom, or left to right on the screen, we have lung, a complicated paranemonic effusion, or empyema, a misshapen diaphragm, and finally the liver. This can make things quite complicated. Again, finding the diaphragm will be a huge help. If the tissue density is above the diaphragm, but you're not sure if it's lung or effusion, here's another trick. Consolidated lung will have blood flow, whereas complex effusion won't. By placing the colored Doppler box over the tissue density, you'll be able to see whether there is blood flow in the consolidation or the tissue density or not. If there is blood flow, you're highly likely to be in the presence of consolidated lung rather than a complex effusion. Another feature of consolidated lung is that there will often be some residual air remaining in the bronchi. This is visible as hyperechoic spots and lines within the consolidated lung. These are called air bronchograms, just like on chest radiograph. There are two types of air bronchograms to know about. The more common are static air bronchograms. These represent air that is trapped within the bronchi, and so when the lung moves, it moves, but it doesn't have the features of flow that we will see with our next type of air bronchogram. Static air bronchograms can be found with any cause of consolidation, but don't really help us know what the etiology is. Dynamic air bronchograms happen when there is residual air flow in the consolidated lung causing the air in the bronchi to move with inspiration and expiration. They have a flowing quality, sometimes like something like rail cars moving on a train track. Usually, if there is air going into the lung, it should be inflated, so dynamic air bronchograms suggest that something other than just loss of aeration or atelectasis is causing the lung to be consolidated. This is almost always because there is infection in the lung tissue or pneumonia. Consequently, the specificity of dynamic air bronchograms for pneumonia is 95%. Unfortunately, the sensitivity is much lower. One important mimic of air bronchograms to know is air within the stomach, but again, this will be under the diaphragm and devoid of blood flow around the air. It is also much more likely to be on the left side. Mirror image artifact of the liver or spleen can mimic lung consolidation. This tends to happen in the dependent region of healthy lungs where the inter interface of the diaphragm and aerated lung serves as a mirror and projects the liver or the spleen. The absence of bee lines and the disappearance of the mirror image artifact with respiration or small probe movements are good clues to the presence of this normal mirror artifact. You also won't likely see any of the other features of consolidation such as the spine sign. Another phenomenon you may observe, especially with non-consolidated lungs, is the curtain sign. 
This happens at the interface between the lung and abdominal viscera at the level of the diaphragm. The abdominal viscera are visible during exhalation and, with inspiration, the lungs inflate, lower, and a lung artifact appears and obscures the abdominal contents on the screen, signifying that the first thing the ultrasound beam is encountering after the pleura is aerated lung and not effusion or consolidation. The lung artifact may either be in the form of A lines, like here, or B lines. The last lung ultrasound finding we'll discuss is pleural effusion. Most pleural effusions will appear as anechoic or hypoechoic and be located in the dependent regions between the pleural layers or, as we can see on ultrasound, between the parietal pleura on the diaphragm or chest wall and the visceral pleura on the lung. This gives rise to two signs that will help us detect pleural effusions. The quad sign represents the formation of a four-sided anechoic or hypoechoic density. The four sides are formed by the chest wall, the lung line, and the rib shadows on each side. The sinusoid sign occurs when the lung line moves toward the parietal pleura on the chest wall during inspiration. This means the lung is able to move reasonably well within the effusion and, therefore, the effusion is unlikely to be loculated. The effusion is unlikely to be loculated. Another important sign of motion of the lung in the effusion is the jellyfish sign, or lung flapping, we can see, as the lung floats in the effusion. It is important to make sure you see the diaphragm and subdiaphragmatic abdominal viscera when looking at an infusion to make sure it is indeed within the pleura. It is also important to make sure you see the lung and chest wall, again to make sure the effusion you are seeing is within the pleura. Here, it would be easy to be fooled into thinking that this anechoic space is pleural effusion. However, once we note the absence of lung within it and the fact that it is above the parietal pleura, it becomes clear that it is in the chest wall itself. Here's another example where determining the boundaries on effusion is important. On first glance, it might be tempting to say this effusion is entirely inside the pleura. However, on closer inspection, part of the effusion is between two diseased pericardial layers and will require much different management. Different formulas exist to attempt to predict how much fluid is contained inside a pleural effusion and generally perform best for moderate diffusions. However, for most clinical circumstances, qualitative assessment dividing effusions into small, or about 0 to 2.5 centimeters between the lung and the chest wall, moderate, or about 2.5 to 5 centimeters between the lung and the chest wall, and large volume, or more than five centimeters between the lung and chest wall, will be sufficient. Some degree of atelectasis is expected whenever there is a pleural effusion. If the effusion is roughly larger than the consolidated lung, this generally represents passive atelectasis due to the effusion itself. Otherwise, there is either more atelectasis than is expected for the size of the effusion, which may be due to recumbency, mucus plugging, etc., or there is a coexisting cause of lung consolidation, such as pneumonia. Here, the consolidation is mildly larger than expected given the effusion, and so something else is likely contributing to the consolidation. On occasion, 
there won't be any consolidation and you'll be able to appreciate A lines or B lines where the effusion meets the lung. These are termed sub A lines and sub B lines respectively. Apart from size and location, it is also important to note the echogenicity of the fluid. Most effusions will be transidates and will appear anechoic or black. Exudative effusions will generally be hypoechoic or, less commonly, isoechoic or hyperechoic. Here, we can see that there are debris floating around in the effusion. This is termed plankton sign and suggests a complex or exudative effusion. Often, when we see the plankton sign, there will only be one or a few small complexities floating around in the fluid. So it'll be important for you to keep a watchful eye. Here is an example of a mildly hypoechoic and heterogeneous complex pleural effusion with the lung above it and the liver below it. Again, identifying all the local anatomy and the use of color Doppler to confirm the absence of blood flow in the collection can be useful to confirm it is a pleural effusion and not a consolidated lung or abdominal organ. Other times, it will be possible to see thicker fibrin strands in the effusion. Again, this suggests a complex or exudative effusion, more often an empyema, and is likely to warrant drainage. We can also appreciate here that sometimes with necrotizing pneumonias, the border between the lung and the effusion can be difficult to determine. One structure you may see that can be confused for fibrin or adhesions is the inferior pulmonary ligament that ties the base of the lung to the diaphragm. This, seeing this one big strand in an otherwise anechoic appearing effusion will help you know that it is in fact the inferior pulmonary ligament that you are observing and not a complex effusion. Again, the clinical context is likely to help you in these kinds of situations. It is also important to distinguish between fibrin or complexity in an effusion and beam thickness artifact. As we discussed in the artifact module, this is caused by compression of its three-dimensional structure into two dimensions and represents a partial display of the lung. Fanning through the structure will reveal that it is, in fact, merely partially seen lung. That's it for the respiratory ultrasound modules. Naturally, there's a lot more content out there and much more you can continue to learn about respiratory ultrasonography, but hopefully this will help you begin to use ultrasound with a solid base. Don't forget to check out westernsono.com for more information, tutorials, and further lectures.